Republican to be a candidate. We have full disclosure. Not really. I'm back. Yeah, y'all are just too polite. <laughs> Something wrong with that? No, no. Hey, what's going on, Victor? Okay, so what we're going to do is stand in front of this tan machine and light. Hey, Joe. Okay, out that way. So this is uh, basically the control system for the turbine. Uh, about uh, three years ago, four years ago, we put about $850,000 into a new control system because uh, they did not support the old software and a lot of the controllers that were out on the thing. So we put, had to put everything in new. And like I said, it cost us about $850,000. So this tells you what's going on. This is the frequency that we're outputting. We're synced in, red lights, means we're synced into El Paso Electric. So what that means is when we start our generator and El Paso Electric running their stuff, so our waveforms are like this. They're not synced together. So what this machine will do once we get it up to speed and get power putting output and all that stuff, then what we can do, we can sync it the computer can sync it. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. We can sync it based on what's going on with our seeker scope. When it gets right here, that's the time to hit the button and sync it in. Or we can also do it with synchronous generator lights. When the light's on as bright as it's going to get, you hit the sync and it'll lock in. So what that does is here's El Paso Electric, here's, lock, here's our turbine. So they're going like this, and once they get in sync, then you hit it, and now they're in sync. Now, if you don't do that, and you just decide to punch it in at any time, then that turbine's going to go through the roof. Think of about 4.5 megawatts of power. Convert that to horsepower. But take the watt and multiply it by 0.746. And that's how many horsepower you have, quite a few damn horsepower. So what happens is that thing is spinning 1800 RPM. So the electrical field is spinning at 1800 RPM. And if you sink it in without it being synced in with El Paso Electric, what happens is El Paso Electric is so big that it's going to dominate our system. And so what happens is the electric field stops for that amount of time it takes for the El Paso electric field to catch up with ours, and then it wants to start spinning at 1800 RPM. 4.5 megawatts, that ain't gonna happen. So you're gonna break something. I have a piece of a shaft from a hydroelectric dam, a 10 megawatt hydroelectric dam. It's about maybe about that big. It's about that thick and it weighs about 50 pounds. And you can see where they never synced it in ever when they were turning it on. And you can see all the little imperfections in that shaft. And you can also see where it cracked a number of times before it finally broke in half. And it's very interesting to see if you look at it and study it. So, come on. You know, Matt. Oh, you're turn, returning key. So what all these instruments tell us it tells us that the current is about, let's see, one, two, two and a half amps. The voltage is somewhere about 10, 20, 28 volts. That's the current going on to the shaft to set up that conjuring magnetic field. And all we're doing is putting that constant DC in there. And as it flows, as that shaft turns, it's making that magnetic field go up and down and causing the current and the voltage to cyclically change. Uh, power factor 0 0.9, our power factor on that is automatically controlled by the turbine. We have sensors down at our Tortuga substation that match with El Paso Electric so that we always have 0 0.9 power factor lagging because if we don't, we're going to pay a large cost. So that's 
So this saves y'all a lot of confusion. Although it's still with us, sorry. What my fault. AC amperage, about 620, 640 amps coming out of there at about 4200. And you can look right here, and this is exactly what we're putting out. We're putting out 628, 629, at 2441, I mean at 4241. And we're putting about 4.1516 megawatts out. Same thing that these tell us. Anybody earhead? Earhead? Anybody earhead sort of kind of maybe? <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. So what happens when you put polar air into your engine? You get more air into the engine, you get more horsepower coming out, right? Same thing with this. We have uh, radiators like evaporative cooling that we send air through in the summer to cool the air down, you know, it's 100 degrees out. We can get it down to about 50, 60 degrees when it's really hot outside. And so that keeps our turbine putting out a nice even amount of power. It doesn't okay. drop down. If we didn't have the radiator, or yeah, the cooling effect on the air going into it, then what would happen, we'd be pulling about 3.8, 3.7 megawatts because the air is so hot, it's not dense. When we cool it down, the air gets dense. We get more oxygen in it. We get better horsepower. We get more output. About 10 years ago now, in 2011, when it froze, anybody from Las Cruces? It froze. Remember when it got down to like minus 7, minus 11, mm. whatever it was? This thing was putting out 5.1 and a half megawatts because the air was so cold. So, just saying, that's what happens. The denser the air, the more power we get out. So this is our control system. It tells us it monitors all kinds of stuff, varying temperature, vibration, all kinds of crap. And if it, anything goes wrong with the turbine, then it automatically shuts it down. Okay. Whenever you get a chance, sir, we're ready. Yeah. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go outside Oh, we're not going outside the building. We're just going right here to this big green machine over here. You'll see all the heat coming off of it. There's uh, over there that little box inside the door. There's some earplugs if you want to put earplugs in. <clears throat> it's going to be loud out there. We're going to open up the doors. You'll see the shaft of air coming straight into it. In there is the radiator. This side of that radiator area, there's an exhaust where if we don't want to use steam, it'll go straight up. We also have a cooling tower coming into the actual generator itself to keep it cool. Uh, earplugs, you guys want earplugs? The turbine's pretty low.
Like I say, we have another electric chiller, big glycol chiller, except it's a glycol chiller, not a water chiller. Those are water chillers. We have a glycol chiller that makes ice. And then we have this chiller over here. Because 
they screwed up. They fixed this again, plus paid for the first pick. It was about $100,000 for the first pick. It was about $250,000 for the second pick. We paid to keep our scheme 99% clean. It cost us $150,000 to do that. Something that we weren't prepared to pay for, but we're trying to do our part. We pay anywhere from forty to about sixty thousand dollars a year to have an engineer come in here every week and make sure our water and our steam is one hundred or ninety nine percent clean. Does that mean the water in the cool pools really clean, potable? Yes, yeah, it's also very clean. Okay. Because otherwise, what happens is start scaling up the tanks and doing all that stuff, and it just causes a whole lot. Of so our steam is 99% clean, our water in the tanks are about 97, something like that. It's not 100 So when the apocalypse happens, come here to get water when you're dying of thirst. Yeah, well, yeah. But, you know, still, we don't want to keep that as clean as this anyway. Mm -hmm. Because this was designed to be, to use 98, 99% and to get it reworked, we cost us, well, you'd have to take this one out and buy a new one and put it in. Now, you could probably sell this one at the time for, you know, $750,000 or something. But it would cost us right at, instead of $1.25 million, it would cost us about $1.75 million because now they have to make everything much more beefy to take that unclean steam so it doesn't mess anything up. So, make sure you do your homework and you understand exactly what's going on when you put something in because if you don't, then your company is going to cut. An email, otherwise I'm not going to Here goes into those transformers as 4160 comes out of those transformers. One of those transformers keep this switch, which is 239, and they keep this other switch at 239, 23,900 volts. Don't get close, it'll kill you. When I first came here in 2009, the next summer, so that's one of my switches. This is one of my switches. This is one of my switches. That's one of the original switches. That's an air switch. So everything in that switch, if you touch it, you die. Just son. It's live, all the parts are live. You stick your hand in there, whatever, you're good. I can open this switch up, so if y'all wanna come back next week, we'll meet over here, we'll walk up to Astronomy and I'll open one of these switches and I'll stick my foot in there and touch everything. Well, I thought I was gonna touch everything. I'll touch everything, touch it with my hand as well. Cause it's all dead. Can't get out. It's all rubberized. This is a vacuum switch. That was an air switch. This used to be an air switch. That used to be an air switch. That switch down there used to be an FS6 gas switch. Anybody know FS6 gas? Sounds bad for the environment. Well, it sure is bad for the environment. So that was a leaker. The old one that was there was a leaker. So it would take me about, well, my cruise. Not my crews, but the electric stuff, guys. It would take them about an hour and a half to fill that up with $3,000 worth of FS6 gas. And then we could switch it. So if it was an emergency, it took me an hour and a half to fill it up with gas so I could switch it. And what that gas is, is an inner gas. And so when you pull the arc, what does an inductor not want to do? What does it not want to see? It does not want to see an instantaneous change in current. So it'll pull an arc and it'll melt everything in there. So what you do is you inject something like FS6 gas in there, an inert gas with no oxygen, so when you open it up, there's no arc. 
this switch and that switch and that switch down there uses a vacuum. So there's no air in there, there's no oxygen, there's no nothing. So when I open the switch, I don't get an arc and burn everything up. To fix an FS6 gas switch, yeah, they're about the same as this solid dielectric switch here, FS6 gas. If I have to fix an FS6 gas switch, it costs me three or four days. And I'm not going to get three or four days to shut down a building. It will also cost me about twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars, depending on how big the switch is, to fix it. And then there's no guarantee that it won't leak worse, and there's no guarantee that it won't leak at all. Leak at all. So why am I going to spend twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars with a four-day outage when I can buy one of these puppies right here, a six-way fit switch? for about $60,000 and put it in in less than two hours. This works, baby. This is the way to go. Dead front, I can touch everything I want. I can see what's going on. For an FS6 gas switch, I can't see it. So these three switches, these three switches were put in in 2010. That switch over there replaced an FS6 gas switch this past summer summer 2020. It works great. So, uh, the reason we came, I came in and we swapped these two out was in the summer of 2010, on one of our switches at Tortugas, we had a fault. And it was a single phase fault. And we inspected all kinds of crap. We cut wires. We checked everything. We never found it. So then about three weeks later, we had a three-phase fault on the line. Checked everything. Couldn't find it. Couldn't see anything. Nothing wrong. We cut wires. We probably spent twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 just in parts and another fifty, sixty thousand dollars in man hours trying to track that stuff down if we did. So about two years later, we're doing our preventive maintenance PM stuff on this switch yard here. And the electrician that's doing the PM called me up and he says, hey Dale, why don't you come down here? I think I found our single phase fault from last summer. So I come down here and he points to the other side of the air switch over there and he says, see those burn marks? Let me show you. He opens it up and you can see where we, do, we don't know what it was got in there it could have been water it could have been tracking it could have been humidity a real bad humidity day it could have been a snake or a rat or a ringtail cat or something like in there but we looked all over in there never found a skeleton or anything like that so we still don't know what it was and he says let me show you something else so he walked over to the other switch, and it, that was the three-phase fault. You can see the melting. It, it, I'll see if I can bring you a, a, a video Monday and show you a video of the switch opening up. It, it's truly amazing. But what it does, it just melts everything because it pulls an arc, and that arc starts melting the metal, and it blasts out into your face. It's called arc flash if you get caught in it. But uh, anyway, we, did, we looked in there and we couldn't find anything. And we said, okay, since it blew, we're just going to go ahead and replace both switches because we don't want to have that again. So I did the design. We put it in. I picked the switch. I made sure they were okay with it. And this is what we started using. One of the things as an engineer, and I want to make sure you get this, is you never touch a tool. You, if if you're doing what I do, okay. If you're doing maintenance, electrician. If you're working in a factory, something like that, you never touch a tool. You have an electrician with you, and he will do everything you want him to do. He tell him what to do. Now that doesn't mean that he's going to do everything you tell him to do, because he's going to say, well, you know, that might not be too safe, and you're going to say, well, why is that? Or what you should say is, why is that? 
and he will explain it to you and hope you understand what he's talking about. You say, yeah, you know, you're probably right. Let's, what, what do you suggest we do to figure that out? And he'll give you his suggestion than I suggest that you take. And the reason is, is because he knows more about this stuff than you will ever know. He'll go up to him and say, well, I have a four-year degree, and you will do what the hell I tell you to do. And he will not. And if he does, and he's shocked, he's going to come back and beat the hell out of him. Just saying. So, you need to compromise sometimes. And I always run it by the electrician because I want their buy-in. I don't want them working on something that I like. I want them to work on something that they like. And this switch right here, like I say, if you wanted to cook breakfast and eat it off that switch gear in there, you could do it and it wouldn't hurt you at all. Now, you've got to be pretty froggy to do that. Just saying. But, you go down to that one and it'll blow up before you get plugged. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? So, what we're going to do next week, if you want, don't forget to send me an email. Two points on the final grade. Usually it didn't help too many people. And I usually do swim meets. But they don't do swim meets anymore. So we're doing tours. Uh, no questions? We're done? Go home, drink beer, eat martini, chocolate martini. No, no, I don't think that stuff either. It sucks. Okay.
And if we do have a problem, then we have three 200 amp fuses, about a megawatt and a half, in there, and they should blow. Two of the fuses blew. One of the fuses did not. In fact, a 200 amp fuse allowed 600 amps to go through it and did not blow. We had crap all over campus that was out. Research equipment. Oh, and we had problems for a year and a half. We spent, my crew spent a million and a half dollars fixing everything. I don't know how much insurance money was. I know there was a million dollar machine over at King Hall that had to be fixed. There were a couple over at Chemistry. And what we found out was, it wasn't the guys in the building backing their butt up against the kill switch. That's happened. You saw all those plastic covers? Those plastic covers? We had a guy back into that one day and shut everything down. Didn't hurt anything. Didn't cost us any money. But still, shut down the turbine. Got us dry started. Blah, blah, blah. So what happened was, we figured out what happened. The number one prime oil circulating pump, the cup so the turbine shut down on a high oil on the bearing, high oil bearing temperature. That's not bad, that's okay. We got three damn butters here, what the hell? This one was on off. It wasn't on automatic. So if this one goes down, this one automatically starts up. No, uh-uh, didn't happen. This one's on off. This one was on lockout, tagout, being repaired, so it was off. So when that one went off, this one didn't come off because it was turned off. This one didn't come off because it was locked out, tagout. This one goes down. 600 amps go through a 200 amp fuse. I got my ass to all over and up and down. You couldn't do that. You're not supposed to do that. They do it all the time. El Paso Electric does it all the time. That's okay. Anyway, so now every shift they come out and make sure these switches are in the proper order. The prime mover, and they swap every month. So one month this will be prime, that next month that will be prime, that next month this one will be prime. So it's going to be prime, secondary, tertiary, backup. So what they have is on, Auto, auto. And they come out every shift and make sure those switches are in that room. Because if something happens to the prime, then the secondary will pick up. If something happens to the secondary, the tertiary picks up. And if the tertiary goes something wrong with that, then the whole damn system shuts down, which is okay. I mean, we can have a hundred covers out here. What's the probability? And that's where the money comes in. What? Probability. Because it's all going to be about money. Okay. I'm tired, so I, I know y'all are. Then we're going to go around by the turbine, go up the stairs you came down, and we're done. Don't forget to email me if you want the two points. Uh, you only remembered her name. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember that sometimes. What's the story with this wood here? We'll see you, Victor. The, this wood panel decoration. What's the story with that?
Weird pattern. This thing, this weird pattern. I always see this, and I'm like, what? I, I, this was built in 1964. That, I think that's Aztec, but I'm not sure. Oh, okay. They're trying to theme the campus. Have a nice day. You too. Have a nice lunch, nice beers. Oh, well, you know, as long as I stay alive, I don't care. And my teeth stays alive. Yeah, your Rubicon. <laughs>